Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining in, those out there, and then thank you so much for those here for giving your time and your, your dedication to um, be with us in this Wednesday night youth service. And we really are encouraged and we really appreciate your, your efforts, truly. Um, before we go, a little announcement. Um, our church, um, in general, uh, next Sunday, not not this Sunday, but next Sunday, we will have our Mother's Day service. Uh, we'll start at 1030, followed by a fellowship luncheon that we will have um, in the dining hall thereafter. And then also, um, the ULSB um, conference that is set for um, June the 26th to the 24th, um, registration is right there. Um, and I think they should be some registration online. If not, we'll post that online for you uh, if you're interested. A deadline, I believe, is within May uh, to hopefully get all of the the forms in and the price and the um, options are on that uh, form. So please, um, if you're interested in going, we would love to, to have you go. Um, it'll be my, my first time. I've never been there. And then I will help, uh, I think, another... Um, leader over there stream the service so we'll have that on top of this so it'll be a little interesting challenge so in any how uh, without further ado let's give it up to olivia and my beautiful daughter claire as they lead praise and worship okay All right, thanks everyone will please stand for praise and worship There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare, you're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. 
Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed When we've been there ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing god's praise than when we first begun oh, amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Everyone, please close your eyes and bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you that we're able to be here together, that we're here well, and that we all made it here safely, and that we're, even that we're able to um, worship you, Lord, in like a safe place. Um, I just want to uplift some prayer requests just uh, for the stream, Lord, that everything goes well and that people out there watching lord that hopefully they're able to make it with us here in person lord and also for um brother lena's lesson lord that um you be with him may be with us that we're able to understand the message lord and hopefully able to use it for the rest of our lives lord and i just want to lift um for the for the kiddos and everyone that's at school, that I be with them, Lord, that this week is finals, and also next week, Lord, that you be with them during the last stretch of um, the school year, Lord, and that they know that you're with them, and that um, that you give them strength to get through it. And also for the people at work, Lord, that you give them the strength to give to get through those long hours. And just to provide for the family and that they know that whatever thing, whatever they're going through, Lord, that they know that you're with them. In your name, Jesus Christ, amen. Hello, everybody. Good evening. So we're going to look into 
the story of Paul and King Agrippa. And so we will be reading out of Acts chapter 26. And so, and that's going to be the main focus. It's the entire chapter of Acts 26. So I'll do quickly summarize what happened, but to give you an idea, in Acts 26, we find the longest and most important of the five speeches the Apostle Paul made to defend himself and the gospel. Many charges have been leveled against Paul by the Jewish people, including the charges that he was against the law, against the temple, and against Caesar. Paul was in prison in a place called Caesar, so that he could be turned on for these charges. But in truth, none of these charges were ever proven. Paul was innocent of these false charges, yet because of politics, the Roman governors, Felix and Festus, did not set him free. When Paul saw that he was not receiving justice at the hands of the governors, he appealed as a Roman citizen to Caesar for an opportunity to defend himself in the court of Caesar. And so this is where the story takes place. And now before we go into depth into Acts 26, I will lead us into a word of prayer. Uh, please pray with me. Uh, gracious Father, as always, we want to uplift your holy name. We want to thank you for your, for, your, for your glorious gift and your gracious gift of your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. May we never forget this gift. May we never take it for granted. May we never take your presence for, get, for granted as well in what you've given us. Please, Father, please be here with us. We invite you here, your presence, to be here with us. And please be with me as I uh, do my best in my ability to convey your word as, as best as possible. And, and Father, let's pray that whoever hears the words, uh, hears your word, Father, will will have a place in your heart to really just to keep it with them and hope it lives out with them for our lives. And with that said, we just lift this, this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so again, um, the setting right here, if you look at, look at the picture, the person asked, if you already tell the person in the purple is, is King Agrippa and the person in the, in the green was Paul, the Apostle Paul. So King Agrippa had entered the auditorium with, with the great pomp, like this, this aura, like he knew he was in charge. Festus, who's not in the picture, I don't believe, Festus was a, a part of this story too. He was one of the governors that told King Agrippa about Paul and why he was a prisoner. And Agrippa, once he heard about this, he already knew about Paul. I'm going to tell you why he knows about Paul. As soon as Agrippa heard that Paul was in prison, he wanted to hear from him himself. And he permitted him to speak in front of him. So if we go to, again, just uh, follow me in Acts chapters 26. Again, we're going to read the whole chapter. We're just going to break it down into segments. The f so we're going to read the first eight chapters. Um, I'm sorry, eight first eight verses. Um, Acts chapters 26, verses 1 through 8. Verse 1, it says, Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa. I am to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially since you are very knowledgeable about all the Jewish, cult, Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning amongst my own people and in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time, and that they're willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of religion, I lived as a Pharisee. 
And now I stand on trial because of the hope in what God promised to our ancestors. The promise of our 12 tribes hope to reach as they earnestly serve him night and day. King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why do any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? And so, as I stated, King Agrippa knows of Paul because Paul is standing before the man whose great-grandfather had tried to kill Jesus as a baby. His grandfather had John the Baptist beheaded. His father had been martyred, had martyred the first apostle, James. Agrippa's, King Agrippa's family history made him unlikely to receive Paul in the most warmest way. Paul was fortunate, though, to address Agrippa. He knew much of the Jewish life. Paul also sincerely wanted to convert Agrippa. So what this chapter already tells us is that Paul made it a purpose to really spread the gospel in such a way that if anybody's here within distance of his words, he's willing to preach them and not only try to preach them, but to give them the, the chance to uh, repent and, and accept Christ as the Lord and Savior. Paul stressed his life as a Pharisee, as, as noted in the first eight verses. They believe, as a Pharisee, they believe the Old Testament promises as well as the resurrection of the dead. Um, as noted, and well, you don't have to go to this verse, but out of Acts 23, six, uh, verses 6 and 8, it says, But when Paul perceived that one part were uh, uh, Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope in the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. For the Sadducees say that there, that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And so, again, just kind of, Paul's trying to summarize his life in such a way that he's trying to appeal to the king in front of him and just plead in this case his defense why he's, he's not guilty of the charges that, that this presented before him. And so, but while Paul's trying to defend himself, he's really trying to, trying to preach the word of God to him as well in hopes that he can reach King Agrippa's heart. And so a couple of lessons that we could take from Paul here. What's keeping us from really spreading the gospels ourselves, even if we're not in this, um, this situation that, that Paul is in, that is on the verge of being persecuted or being put in prison for life or even worse? What's preventing us from doing the same what Paul is doing in our everyday lives and not feeling all that stress coming upon us. So, and within, the, within these verses, the hope of promise included the res, resurrection of the dead. And there are two verses that reference this, and we don't have to go through this. Uh, out of Daniel 12, 2, it says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake some to everlasting life, some to shame, and everlasting content. And out of Job 19, 25 to 27, it says, For I know my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, for this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. So if God can raise others from the dead, why is it so hard to believe that he raised Jesus from the dead? And so, again, this is kind of a plea that, that, that again, Paul's giving to the king. And so the second part of this, uh, if you want to read, if we want to, uh, we could read on is that uh, Paul tells of his conversion of why 
he's he's a believer in Christ. And so, you read from verses 9 to 18, at Acts chapter 26, 9 to 18, it says, In fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority for that from the, from the chief priest. When they were put to death, I was in agreement. I was in agreement against them. In all the synagogues, I often punished them and tried to make them and tried to make them blast me. Since I was terribly enraged at them, I persuaded I persuaded them even to foreign cities. Oh, I'm sorry. I pursued them even to foreign cities. I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with authority and a commission from the chief priest, King Agrippa. While on the road at midday, midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me in Arabic, translated, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may, they may turn from darkness to light and from the, the power of Satan to God that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and share amongst who are sanctified by faith in me. Okay. And so within this, Paul admits that he had been where they are now. He's talking about those living without Christ, which is most of the Roman citizens at that time. He also admits that those he had locked up were saints. So he admitted in the past, as a Pharisee, he went out and persecuted Christians himself. Paul now tells Agrippa, the king, what caused this great change. God had been prodding him to accept Jesus. This prodding then became a nail that pierced his heart. The word minister is, is a word that means the one who serves a higher will. Jesus appeared to Paul to qualify him as apostle. Within Acts 22, 14 and 15, it says, Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will, and see that just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. So God was, as noted within these verses, God was sending Paul to both Jews and Gentiles to open their eyes and turn them away, turn them from darkness. And as something that goes along with this, out of Ephesians 5, 8, it says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So, all right. And so, the verses nine to eighteen again just kind of tells you, tells Paul of his, of his, reason for believing in Christ. In the next set of verses, we're going to see that Paul preaches the resurrection. So, out of Acts 26, verses 19 to 27. Verse 
verse 19 says, So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first, and to those in Jerusalem, and all the region of Judea, and to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works wonder works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and were trying to kill me. To this very day, I, had, I have had help from God, and I stand and testify to both great and small, saying nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said would take place that the Messiah must suffer, and that, as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and the Gentiles. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You are out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. But Paul replied, I am not out of my mind, most ex excellent Festus. On the contrary, I am speaking words of truth and good, good, and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters, and I can, boldly, I can speak boldly to him. For I am convinced that none of these things has escaped his notice since this was not done in the corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. So... You know, from this, you know, if, if Paul obeyed, he was thinking of the notions like maybe the king should obey as well. Again, just the first point, he wanted the king to repent. And he's given a chance. The king granted him permission to speak. And so if he did that, if he did change, his new life would not be easy, as it is for most Christians, or all Christians. Agrippa would have been had the same strength available that God had, had given Paul. When you're talking about the resurrection, it, when you talk about Paul's life, you, found, you find often that Paul preached from this and, and, and uh, ministers from this, the, the, gospel, the, the resurrection. Because it's important to note that Jesus was the first to be raised to never die again. But if you notice... Apparently, Festus had become more and more agitated at Paul's words and finally interrupted. And Festus says he was, out of, he was the one out of his mind. Paul, in his right mind, he was in his right mind. Soberly thinking. And at this time, Christianity was well known. And the king knew this. The prophets had spoken about Jesus the Messiah and that he would die and be raised. Paul, on trial before the king, puts the, puts, the, puts the king on trial before Christ. Paul's appeal is to no vague, to no vague word or, or bashful plea. When Paul speaks with the king, he wasn't trying to speak over him with big words or anything. Paul was speaking plainly, boldly, directly, but also with respect as well. He didn't shoot over Agrippa's head, but he let the arrows fly at his heart. Before watching the eyes of everyone who, before watching, before the watching eyes of everyone who is anyone in the region, Paul looked in his eyes and said, and for all to hear, King Agrippa, do you, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. So what Paul was saying is that King Agrippa had a curious curiosity about the resurrection and who Jesus was. Sometimes in our lives, all it takes is for someone to be curious about what our faith is. Sometimes in our lives, it, all it takes is for people to come up with and say, hey, you're acting differently. Um, it's like, uh, can you tell me why? Things like that. The way you act outside of church can leave an impression on people that 
you might know be paying attention to you. And so, <clears throat> the arrow finds its mark. The king staggers. In wonder, he asks, in short time, would you, presume, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And I'm jumping ahead, but this is basically what we're going to read out of verse 28 in the last set of verses. So, in the last set of verses, this is how King Agrippa responds. So you read with me out of Acts 26, verses 28 to 32. Agrippa said to Paul, Are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you, but all who will listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. The king, the governor, Bernice, and those sitting, uh, those sitting with them got up. And when they had left, they talked with each other and said, this man is not doing anything to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he not appealed to Caesar. So again, just... That, that last verse alone is that Paul was being held against his own will because, of, because Festus thought he was committing crimes that he didn't commit. And so, and then he had to be pleading in front of the king. But if you think about it this way, I think there was a, the event itself was ordained by God because it allowed Paul to speak in front of the king, whereas the king would never have been accessible to Paul or to any other person that, that was like Paul or to any other normal person. I think it's important to really talk about this, this, story, this story in itself is because it was God, or, God ordained that this would happen. It tells us that nothing in our life happens by accident or is just a consequence. It is God ordained. I think a lesson we, we all another lesson we could take from Paul is that <clears throat> is that when we, when we talk about um, again just referring from the verse in verse twenty eight um, this translation this translation says in a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian and I think a lot of times if in our in our lives we only get to encounter random people for a short amount of time God allows us to be in that moment, but do we use that moment for ourselves or are we conscious that God is allowing us to have this time with others? And Paul really took advantage of this. Whereas when we talk about having long, a long time or having long relationships or, or, or being in a place where it's more organic, more relational, such as the church. We get, a, we get more time to uh, evangelize the people longer as they're willing to commit more to Christ. But that's something we have to think about as well. Are we waiting for people to come to us so, we, that, we, so that we can evangelize to them? I think a lot, of, a lot of churches faces that problem. They think that they can wait for people to come to them, and then we can preach the word to them. Whereas God says, hey, no matter if you're worshiping at the church or not, outside of church, you have the ability and the time to, to reach out to others on your own as well. And so, so, but what I'm saying is there's nothing wrong with either way, but, but it's presented to us as, as viable options. You know, this form of evangelism, when you talk about the long, organic, relational evangelism, it's useful where people are already woven into our lives. So, for instance, like a relative, they're already in our lives, but do we take advantage to really reach out to them or have an attempt to reach out to them? Or our friends, you know, things of that nature. Um, with these, we see again, we want to witness our lives and open up to, open up to us that we might bring Christ 
to their specific hopes, sins, and sorrows. One break at a time, one conversation at a time, because we have more time, so we think. Whether it's short or long, he declared, Paul declared to Agrippa, I wish you would be a Christian. And that makes space for the long-term relational uh, approach for evangelism. But how many of us today have jet-setted the first half, the short term, the first conversational evangelism that arrested the king? He did not expect that Paul would, would press the relevance of this news to his conscience and call for a response in their first conversation. In short time, the king asked, would you persuade me to be a Christian? In short time, Paul would. Not only did Paul have the spine to evangelize to the king in front of his notable somebodies, but he turned to them, seeking to win everyone within the, the range of his voice to Christ. As he, as he said in Acts, uh, the last part of Acts, I would that all of you to be Christians just as I am, as he said to the spectators. He only had one shot. So, with little regard for his own well-being, he addressed everyone openly. Again, just saying, I would, I would that all of you believe and were saved. And so, and to harp on the more short, short-term way of evangelism, there are many things that people do. Uh, prayer walks, meaning people just walk by neighborhoods and just pray randomly for for anybody in the neighborhood. They don't even have to encounter them. They just pray for God's presence to be in their lives. We don't have to be present to, to know of God's miracles in people's lives. We don't need to be there. That's what the power of prayer does for us. I'm reminded of a story in China. And every other Tuesday, I meet up with a, with a gentleman for a prayer meeting. And because he had so much experience in, 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 mission, in missions and whatnot, he tells stories for hours and hours. So he was reminded of this story in China. Um, I believe outside of Hong Kong. I could be wrong, but um, just for the story's sake. Um, there had been a man who was declared dead, um, but yet from the story, there are evangelisms ne nearby um, really in tune with God said, and they, they heard God's calling and said, saying, hey, I think you should go to the hospital because then you need to pray for this man. When they went to approach this man and said his name because they already had his information, they knew about him, they knew his name, they, they asked about the man in the hospital, and they said, well, he's been declared dead for two days. I was like, and the story goes is that they were given access to the morgue, and for whatever reason, um, they were allowed there and to see the body. But what the evangelist did was prayed over the body. They prayed for quite some time, to the point where it got the attention of the nurses and doctors there. And the doctors and nurses said, well, what are these people doing here? You know, the person's already declared dead. And so... They got done with the prayer, and when I said, they asked if they could come, come back again the next day. Well, and they said yes. And so I think the reason why they, they let him say yes is because the person who, was, the person who had passed on had no family uh, to claim him. So, so they come back the next day. These evangelisms, they prayed again, and they prayed for some time. Same thing happened again. The nurses and doctors gathered, and just probably just back in their mind, just, just saying things like, well, these people are crazy. Why are they doing this? And so, so they get done with the prayer, and they leave town. And so, and as the story goes, and you can believe it if you want to, but I believe that nothing is impossible outside of the realm of God. And then within hours of the evangelism leaving, leaving town, it had been maybe weeks or two weeks 
at, um, that they got word that the gentleman that we're praying for was raised from the dead. And so, again, is this, is this a matter of consequences or is this, is this the willing of God? And again, like I said, people don't have to, be, those who were praying were already away from the city. They were away from the hospital. They, might, they didn't know that this probably was going to happen. They were being obedient. They heard God's calling to do so. It takes an act of faith on our part to really share our lives with others in, in regards to, uh, in, in order to, to share the truth, to share the gospel. Can we be obedient to that call? Is what I'm asking. Can we be like Paul and be readily available to, to be unashamed, to be unafraid, and to speak boldly about God's truth to others? no matter the situation. So, <clears throat> so when we talk about the short-term um, evangelism, there's this, there's this misconception saying Jesus can't save in one conversation. But if we forget that the, go- forget that the gospel it's the power of God for salvation. We may have to re- rethink that. Offering a, a word of, of truth, or true hope to a stranger, well, offering a, a word of true hope to a stranger can't do anything but to look, make me look foolish, so why bother? But Paul remembered the power of the gospel. One vibrating with divine life, quaking with expectations. It is muscular enough to capture and liberate even the, sh- the chief of sinners. He was willing to persuade them with a loud voice at his trial and expected King Agrippa, the military tribunes, and the prominent men of the city to cast off their crowns and bow their knees before the king of glory. Another example we could take is if Jehovah's Witnesses, with their door-to-door evangelism, believed that have believe that they have a message for people to hear whoever answers that door why not the actual witnesses of Jehovah so in my experience the less short term mindset I have in the beginning the harder the long term evangelism, evangelism tends to be what that, what that means is if I approach a new friend and and then say, ask us a question, what's most important to you? If I don't say that being a Christian is the most important thing to me in the beginning, it might be harder for me to express that letter later on in a relationship with that new friend. If we let it known right at the beginning who we are, who we are in Christ in the beginning with new people, new friends, and whoever we come across, it becomes easier to bring up the conversation with Jesus later on. Because it doesn't all have to be it doesn't all have to be there in the beginning. You just hope that you continue to build that relationship with them in order to bring up the, the word of God at a later time. And so and so <clears throat> lastly I'll end it with this. And again, we're talking about Paul and his way of evangelism. And as a way of an example, we could, we could take heed and, and to learn from him. Um, there's, um, there's a story I'm reminded of as well about a faithful woman. And a lot of people might call her a saint. And so this is... Um, Risley tell, tells people, you know, I prayed every day for God to send me one person that day to tell about Jesus. And in 50 years, he has not filmed me once. So this elderly woman who has prayed every day for 50 years to send, for God to send her at least one person to, sell, to tell about Jesus. 
God has not filled her. Paul modeled, this is the model of Paul, meaning that with such conviction, boldness, firmness, but in between, there's a, there's a lot of respectability and, and politeness in there as well. There's a way to evangelize both short-term and long-term. Let us pray such prayers and not fail when it comes to speak. Now, here's the, here's the end of the story. I need to tell you this. Agrippa and those with him have heard the, the gospel message through Paul, but it was not Paul's fault that they did not accept it. People can obey like Paul did or walk away like Agrippa. Even though Agrippa was almost persuaded, he was still entirely lost. So, again, what does that tell us? It, it should tell us that it is our job to get the word out there, but it's not our job to convince people that they need Christ. They had to know that themselves. We leave that up to God. Convicting people is up to God. But it calls on us to be faithful and to tell people about him and his son. So that being said, I pray for each one of you who are in a position to, to, be, to be useful to God, to be used as a vessel to God. If we could just pray the, the simple but yet effective and, and bold prayer as the, the elderly saint I just mentioned. God, I, I wish you, I pray that you send me at least one person each day to, for me to tell about Jesus. And I think it will have a real direct effect in our lives as we build, continue to build up God's kingdom. Thank you for listening to me. Um, and I hope the word of God reaches to you today, wherever you are. And so with that being said, I'm going to end this in the word of prayer. Our oh Lord, our Father in heaven, thank you for just allowing us to be here, allowing us just to soak in the lessons from your, from your servant, Paul, to learn that there's a way to, to, to boldly speak your name and, and to evangelize in such a way that it becomes effective. And but to know that we don't have to be present in order to experience your miracles as you call us to be obedient and just to to be able to share with others. I pray that in our hearts we 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 continue just to be in that, that pathway just to continue to share. I pray that we don't wait for us for others to come to us in order to evangelize as many churches have a problem with. But I pray that our time with you outside of church can be most effective and we can have an impact on in, 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 in that way. Father, as we leave this place, I pray for, for continued uh, provisions for, for, for guidance in our lives, for blessings, uh, for for wisdom upon our lives, Father. And so you might be some of us who, who are wondering what to do next with our lives, how we could be effective in our own ministries, and how we could, be, we could, uh, we could better uh, serve our church. What it matter be the case, Lord, I just pray that we come to you to this. Father, I just pray that we, you be with the students that are, aren't here as they're taking their finals, please be with them. Um, help them gain the knowledge and just to retain what they need to, to be successful and what they need to be at. For all of us here, uh, whether it's work or, or whatever we could do in our free time, I pray that we could use it to, to the utmost uh, to the utmost to, to glorify you, Father. And with that being said, we just pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you all.